All right, let's welcome everybody out today to episode 348 of I Am Salt Lake Podcast. My name's Chris. And my name's Chrissy. Hey, guess what, guys? Before we get into this episode, I've been really, really excited to uh, share this with you. We finally got t-shirts. That's right. It's taken us six years to finally get some t-shirts for you guys. And these are really awesome t-shirts. Uh, they're professionally printed. We got them on three different colors. We got them on green shirts, gray shirts, and yellow shirts, which those are my favorite. They are the logo. Go check them out. You can actually uh, check it out by going to IamSaltLake.BigCartel.com. We have all three shirts up there. This is a great way to support the podcast and also tell the world about your favorite podcast. So so head on over there, IamSaltLake.BigCartel.com. And I'm sure we're going to put a link up on on the website, uh, IamSaltLake.com. Yep, absolutely. At, at some point, maybe a little banner. A little or banner ad. We like can that. give ourselves our own banner ad. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're recording out of Mountain West Hard Cider Facilities right here in the heart of Salt Lake City. These guys have been so awesome and they've been letting us use their facilities to record our interviews for you guys. So you should stop by here and visit them and support them for being so rad. Their address is 425 North, 400 West in Salt Lake City. Just right north of the gateway. I mean, seriously, you can't miss it. We're on the west side of the road. Stop on by. It's get, beautiful. Get a drink here. But uh, hey, listen up, though. If this is your first time listening to us and you're like, what is this podcast? What is this podcast that my mom told me to listen to? Well, this is a podcast all about uh, we're showcasing the awesome people here in Salt Lake City. We get to talk to musicians, artists, business owners, restaurant owners, even bartenders and food truck owners, really anyone who has a cool story. So we have a whole back catalog of six years of episodes. They're all right there on the website. Check it out. We've been talking with some great people here in Salt Lake City that, like I said, have a cool story. Like today on the podcast, we got to sit down and have an awesome conversation with Stuart Derman. Stuart is the co-founder and executive director at Wasatch Film Festival. We're going to get into his story and find out what inspired him to start the film festival, what sets this film festival apart from all the others, and how you can get involved. And of course, we're going to find out what Stuart loves about living in Salt Lake City. Hey, but before we jump into this conversation, I got to give some love to our sponsors for this episode. These are the rock stars that are helping keep the lights on around here. Ammon Clough Creative, Five Wives Vodka, and The Melting Pot. We're going to be telling you more about them a little bit later on in the podcast, so stay tuned for that. And as you know, it is downtown farmer's market season. I, I don't know if you guys have heard us talk about it, but... Um, <laughs> They're probably sick of Sometimes I mention it, it once in a while. I love the downtown farmer's market. It is absolutely one of the best parts of the summer. If you get a chance to visit, you can... Uh, you go. It's right downtown. It's at Historic Pioneer Park. It's going every Saturday till October 20th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And it has tons of local artisans that are making some of these amazing things. Honestly, I have to tell you, uh, the baby clothes and the jewelry are t my favorite artisan things to stop by and take pictures of and buy. And But they also have amazing produce. The farmers are so great. They have We got some delicious berries meat. last week. Oh my gosh, we got berries. Oh, I ate them in like two days. They were so good. And there, you know, some grass-fed beef. There's just everything that you want. And it's all wonderful and it's local. Just go get some produce, buy some beautiful jewelry, have a great day downtown. Hey, before we jump into this conversation with Stuart, make sure to hit that subscribe button in whatever podcast player that you're listening to this on. That way you don't miss a single episode of the podcast. And with all that being said, let's jump into that conversation that we had with Stuart Derman when he came and sat down with us and shared his story. Enjoy. This has been a fun question, Stuart. What did your childhood smell like? I don't know if you've heard us ask this to other people that have come on the show. It's been a question I've kind of incorporated over the last few months, and uh, it's been fun to hear re the different replies. Yeah. So my childhood, what did it smell like? You know, I, I think it it depends. Uh, my the, my favorite parts of uh, my childhood are probably uh, clean mountain air. Even though I'm from New Jersey, my favorite parts of growing up were really the trips out west that we would do. It always it always was a little different. It, it's really what got me into the outdoors originally. When I was a young kid, we went on some trips out to Yellowstone, Grand Teton, Southern Utah, and you know, just that, that clean, that clean outdoor natural air and getting away from, uh, 
getting away from the East Coast and everything that's going on out that way. <laughs> so your family would come, would they come out to Utah? Is that kind of how, how you got familiar with you know, Utah? We did a few, uh, a few family trips. Uh, unlike a lot of people, we weren't the types that would go on the typical beach vacation out to, you know, Mexico or whatnot. We went on, we went on trips to national parks. Okay. Which uh, is great, man. Yeah, Yellowstone was, and, 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 uh, I guess that's the only one that you, you know. You <laughs> this is the one national park we're aware of. The arches, there's some. Well, I actually just came back from Moab? Yellowstone. I was okay, just yeah, out that's there right. on a trip. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so you're in New Jersey. Yes. That's what, like all your family's out there. Yes. And now you're here in Utah. What brought you to Utah? Yeah. So I moved out to Utah. Um, they have an amazing program for parks, recreation, and tourism at the University of Utah. Oh, wow. So I decided uh, I had originally started college at the University of Arizona. I knew I always wanted to move out west. But after playing around, trying to figure out what I actually wanted to pursue, I came upon this idea of studying something related to tourism and something that would involve me with uh, with getting out into nature. Uh, so I decided to transition and uh, actually transfer to the University of Utah because they have an amazing program. And that's really what brought me out here. Now the Wasatch Film Festival, we're going to yes. get into that. That's your, that's your, like your baby. That's yeah. your, you started this, right? Yeah. Or, so, um, my partner, Shane Baldwin and I both started the Wasatch Mountain Film Festival when we were in our last year at the U. Okay. Cause that's kind of what I was trying to figure out the time frame yeah. of, you know, you going to the U when the Wasatch Film Festival started, when you moved here to Utah. What did you actually end up studying at the U? Was so, it film? No, actually I had, it's funny because I had no film background before starting okay. the film festival. So I studied, uh, the actual degree or department was parks, recreation and tourism. And I did an emphasis in sustainable tourism management. Wow. Do you, do you, I, I mean, do I you do no things with, with that now? So I I'd say that the film festival is the primary way that mm -hmm. I, I utilize that degree. Separate from that, I've been, I've worked for several companies in marketing as Really, my my primary uh, my primary job, but the film festival is really where my passion lies. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Now we're gonna bounce around here a lot. Beautiful thing, we're a podcast. We can do that. At least I feel like we can. We can do whatever we want. Yeah, right. No, no, uh, nobody's telling us what to do. But so <laughs> this film festival, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. I never even heard about it until you reached out to me. It sounded great. I was like, this is this is right up the alley of coming on the podcast. This is perfect. I've never heard of it, so I want to get to know about it while the listeners get to know about it. How would you describe it to somebody that uh, – what, what, what sets this festival apart from another festival? Yeah, so Utah is definitely no stranger to film festivals, right? We have Sundance exactly. and a myriad of other festivals that happen throughout the state. What makes the Wasatch Mountain Film Festival different – is it's entirely focused on outdoor adventure documentaries and environmental documentaries. The, the festival is. Yeah, the festival is completely focused on that. So everything from uh, a first ascent rock climbing expedition in Antarctica to uh, river conservation issues in Montana and really everything in between. So our, the films that we feature are, you know, they're all outdoor adventure focused, but at the end of the day, all of the films boil down to some interesting story. They're not a lot of outdoor films get um, they're, they're beautiful visually, but they lack a lot of depth. The films that we focus on and that we promote and share are ones that have deep, powerful stories that really connect people with why the outdoors are so important. Do you, do you get a lot of people submitting that you reject? Yeah. So it's gotten more and more competitive over the last couple of years. So we've had four, four festivals. So four years, it's been officially running. We've been working on it for five years. Uh, last year was our largest number of submissions we had. I want to say it was over 600 submissions. Wow. Um, we That's wound crazy. Up, you, yeah, it was a lot. Do you actually <laughs> watch every submission and then respond yes so that <laughs> i mean that well, is you know. one of the hardest parts <laughs> of running this right but that's a, that's a lot of time you yeah, have to get into what, i mean it's how long is a film i mean are they an hour long they range yeah. so our shortest film we've ever showed was about two and a half minutes and our longest film was about two and a half hours so they range from shorts to features and one thing that i wanted to make a big point of when starting this was film festivals for filmmakers tend to be kind of a 
a black hole, right? They mm-hmm. submit their films and they have no idea if people actually watch them or it, how, how deeply they were considered. So I wanted to make sure that every filmmaker who submits knows that we watch every single film that is submitted. Um, if it clearly doesn't meet the submission guidelines, then obviously we, we don't watch the entire thing. Um, but any film that actually meets our submission guidelines, we will watch from start to finish and usually multiple times to actually make a decision whether or not it's included. Wow. Now, now what you said guidelines. Are yeah. Saying, what, what would be against the guidelines that somebody like, like. Give me yeah, so if it's guide, about a dance club, yeah, probably I mean, we've, not had, going. we've had experimental films that they're not documentaries. They really don't have um, any outdoor component or environmental theme. And those are the films that typically they're, they're so far out of the realm of what we would consider being a qualifying film sure. or something that would fit with the festival. And that doesn't mean that we're not open to taking the new festival in different directions. Right. So if we have films that are submitted that, they're not necessarily what we've traditionally screened. Like we had a great local film last year um, called the salt of sound and it didn't, it was about the Utah music scene. Uh, Very well done film, beautiful, had an amazing, uh, amazing backstory. And even though it wasn't outdoor recreation focused or environmentally specific or environmentally focused, what it did have is it talked about mountain culture, right? So the music scene here is part of our culture and we are a mountain community. Mm-hmm. So that we, we found that that still tied in and qualified as a film. So you showed it. Yeah, we showed it. Is it, a, is, it a, is it a great film? It, it sounds is. great. It is. What's like the name the of name. it? Uh, the salt of sound. Salt I wonder if I could it's find actually that. available uh, publicly on YouTube. Now the really? people who created the film um, have published it. Do you, do you, I would imagine, I mean, do you keep all, I would imagine you just have like an amazing movie we do. collection. We do. And, um, yeah, we have terabytes and terabytes of films. We, we keep a, an archive of all the films that have been accepted into the festival. If we had everyone that was, uh, submitted, that you would be too many. Oh my gosh. Rooms of hard drives. Do you um, ever go in and give people constructive feedback on their film? Like if it, if, it's just not up to par. Do you respond yeah. and say, these are the, the areas it was lacking? She Try wants to know if year. you make them cry. Do you make <laughs> yeah. them cry? Do you make no, them cry? No, we What's don't the make them cry. What's the meanest thing you've ever said <laughs> to someone? <laughs> no, you know, it, it depends on the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, some filmmaker, not every filmmaker requests uh, constructive feedback, just given the number of films that we have to go through and process. Yeah. Uh, especially because our the first uh, submission period is free. So we don't charge for submissions for that's the That's right. Beginning. You have like an early bird free. Yeah. I saw that. Okay. Yeah. So that's we have our cool. early bird and it used to be that all films were free to submit. And the only reason we changed that is we started receiving so many mm-hmm. that we just didn't have time to process it. So in an effort to only uh, receive films that really qualify, we started putting some limits and, um, and some submission fees on there. But mm-hmm. if a filmmaker requests uh, feedback on why their film wasn't accepted, we absolutely we do our best to uh, to provide that. Very That's cool. That is so cool. talk about the different uh, deadlines. So you have yeah. a, you have a, the festivals coming like April, right? If yeah. I, so I, going forward, we've played around with our dates over the last couple of years to figure out really when works. We've gone from the end of March to June, and then we've really reeled it back into the first week of April. And that's what it's going to be going for forward. the festival. Yeah, for the festival. And the reason why we went with those dates is at the uh, the first week of April, the, the ski resorts are still open. The weather's changing. Depending on what altitude you're at, you can really do almost anything here. You can ski, you can climb, you can mountain bike, you can hike. It really just depends on what you want to do. That time of year, it's amazing. So for people who want to come into town Mm -hmm. uh, for the festival, they can experience all that Salt Lake and the Wasatch Mountains have to offer. And so that's probably a big goal is to actually increase tourism for this. Absolutely. I I think that um, especially coming in uh, as not being a Utah native, Mm -hmm. I think I saw things from a little bit of a different perspective. We have such an amazing mountain community in the Salt Lake and really across the broader Wasatch range. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't think that it gets the um, the attention necessarily. And there's a lot of people who out there who will say, oh, let's keep Salt Lake a secret. Yeah. Uh, because nah. it's an amazing gem. Look at me. I'm doing a podcast. It is. You're doing a that, podcast. Right? Right? Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, a lot of us kind of take it for granted. And we weren't like we're not even familiar with how great it can yeah. be. Yeah. So it's I think it's really cool to draw attention to it. Yeah. And I and I think that having there. 
the, the outdoor community here is very fractured, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. You have mountain bikers, you have skiers, you have climbers, and they each have their own different organizations, but there isn't necessarily a unifying group or unifying organization that ties those together. That's and, so interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah. And I, I huh. think film is the perfect medium to expose people in each of those communities mm-hmm. to the other outdoor communities that exist here. And it's a, it's really cool because you start to see uh, at the festival, at least attendees who never would have interacted necessarily with these other groups. And you'll hear, um, you know, climbers making plans with mountain bikers to get on the trail. You'll find mountain bikers connecting with uh, paragliders to go get out, get out to point of the mountain. And it's just, it creates this unbelievable connection that I don't think exists or existed prior to this. Now, is this something you have to work on year round yes. or is it, I mean, cause I, w- I would imagine there's a lot of behind the scenes. I mean, oh, for even, sure. Just even doing prepare. a, even doing a podcast, man, I come in here for like an hour to record. There's a lot of behind the scenes going on yep. here. And I would imagine it's the same with a film festival. Yeah. So uh, slowly but surely we've gotten buy-in and built up a team over the last couple of years. Now, one thing that's important to mention is the festival, so we're a 501c3 nonprofit. The actual organization that we started is called Wasatch Mountain Arts. And that was with the intention of the film festival being one of our programs. As you mentioned, the a film festival takes so much of an undertaking to get off the ground that it is it has been our one and only program for a very really since we started. We're just starting to branch off. So it does demand a year-round effort. It is more of an effort. Uh, the last four to five months leading up to the festival oh, get it's pretty be crazy, intense. and it just gets it just gets crazier and crazier. But at the end of the day, it's all worth it. That there's there's this really cool moment um, on opening night I've seen every year where everything's kind of the, the films are playing, um, everyone's in their seats, the program has started, whoever's hosting the screening has you know they've they've started their presentation. And when that first film comes on, I I make a conscious effort to look out at the audience and just see their reactions to the films and seeing those people interacting with these stories and and learning from them. It's just so rewarding to see. Now, how many, how many days is the festival? So it, Uh, it has been, uh, at first, the first year it was a single day or single night. And it's grown to a full week. And you're doing this like Salt Lake, Park City, all, yeah. all over. Yeah, so of. our venues, um, we have multiple venues throughout Salt Lake. Uh, we've been up at the Park City Library for the last couple of years as well. Uh, we're actually talking as well with some people up in Ogden uh, about expanding up there. So we're I've never seen us as a necessarily just a Salt Lake based organization. We're a Wasatch organization. Sure. And, and that's how, that's, that's how great. you have to look at it, man. Yeah. We're oh, like yeah, a, for sure. You know, we're, we're like a, like a family. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, like even when I started this podcast, it was like, do I exclude Provo? Do I exclude Ogden? Eh, we're close enough. I'll yeah. bring them on occasionally. <laughs> they're right? like they're, the weird cousin. They're it's not, okay. They're they not join us. horribly, <laughs> horribly bad people. You know, this is actually a perfect moment. Let's take a break. I have to play a couple messages here from our sponsors. I got a bunch more questions, though, for you, Stuart. So hang tight. We'll be right back. All right. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Ammon Clough Creative. All right, listeners, we got a brand new sponsor for this episode, so we need to have you go give them some extra love and tell them thank you for sponsoring this episode. Ammon Clough Creative, you can find at ammonclough.com, that's A-M-M-O-N-C-L-U-F-F.com. Ammon Clough is an amazing local Salt Lake City photographer and videographer. Ammon Clough focuses on personal and commercial brand growth. Through his photo and video work, which includes ad campaigns, content marketing photography, YouTube filmmaking, and so much more, he seriously has one of the most beautiful websites on the internet, and I'm not kidding. Uh, This is where you can check out his photography and his videography. You can kind of get an idea of, uh, of what he's got going on. Even if you're not in the market for any of these services, like I've mentioned, you're going to want to go check out his website just to see these photos. These are some breathtaking photos, and, and I know that sounds silly to say, but they are. The first time I saw some of the samples of Ammon's work, I was seriously speechless. So there are links up there where you can connect with him on YouTube and Instagram to get more of a taste of the, uh, the stuff that he's capable of doing. 
And I'll tell you a secret. It's Ammon Clough on all social media platforms. It's just A-M-M-O-N-C-L-U-F-F. Again, that's Ammon Clough, all one word. So head on over to his website, ammonclough.com. This is where you can get in touch with him for your next photo or video project. And many thanks to Ammon Clough Creative for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. All right, guys, this episode is sponsored by the very delicious, the very awesome, and the very local Five Wives Vodka. You know, longtime listeners, you guys have heard us talk about them week after week. I mean, these are great. I mean, they sponsor the podcast. So the next time you head over to the state liquor store, pick up a bottle, pick up an extra bottle for your buddy. Or if you head down to your neighborhood bar, ask for Five Wives Vodka by name. There is actually three different flavors. I love to talk about these three different flavors because they're, they're, they're fun and delicious. I mean, you have the original flavor. This is uh, the one that's made from Utah Mountain Spring Water. It's 100% distilled corn spirit, and it's gluten-free. The spring is hidden in Ogden Canyon. It's inaccessible by vehicle, so they're actually hiking out this water five gallons at a time. And I'll tell you what, every time we go to a party at a friend's house or a barbecue, we always bring a bottle of the original Five Wives Vodka to share with everybody because it's so good. I think people expect that out of us now. Chrissy. Probably. <laughs> and you know, that's okay because I'm happy to share the joy. It's pure joy. They also have a flavor that is called Five Wives Sinful. It is a delicious cinnamon flavored vodka. And it's not like the other cinnamon products that give you a cinnamon candy taste in your mouth. Sinful is like a morning cinnamon roll and it only has 76 calories per ounce. There's also the Five Wives Heavenly. Is This is another flavored vodka with a delicious vanilla taste. Heavenly's rich, buttery vanilla flavor comes through without coating your taste buds with sugar, and this results in more vanilla and less calories. What, what are you drinking these days, Chrissy, with oh, Five Wives Vodka? You, you know, I'm an original girl. I'm an original girl. But I am curious what the favorite is among all of our listeners, because the most people who I've talked to in person really love the Heavenly. So this is what you need to do. Come to our Facebook group, yeah. IamSaltLake.com slash group. This will send you to our Facebook group and tell us, post a picture of your favorite Five Wives drink. Yes. And if you drink Heavenly or Sinful, tell us what you mix it with because I want to try new things. Yeah. And head on over to their website, FiveWivesVodka.com. You can find out more about them. You can find out more about the history, webs or uh, recipes, all that good stuff. FiveWivesVodka.com. And as always, many, many thanks to Five Wives Vodka for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. All right, guys, this episode of the podcast is also sponsored by The Melting Pot. The Melting Pot is locally owned and operated right downtown on the corner of Market and Main. If you're ready to experience a unique tableside dining with your friends, with your family, maybe you even have an intimate date night that you need to go to, seriously, go check out The Melting Pot. Fondue fans and grill masters, head on over to the Melting Pot on August 28th, where you can sear your favorite items like steak, chicken, and shrimp to perfection right at your table with our new grill cooking style. Go ahead and show off those grill marks. The Melting Pot, like I said, is locally owned and operated. They are located at 340 Main Street, right on the corner of Market and Main. So book your experience today. Again, many thanks to The Melting Pot for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. So Stuart, let me ask you a question. What do you know now doing this festival? Because I'm sure it's got to be crazy, right? I look back over the, the six years of doing this podcast and I've learned so much, right? What do you know now? Gosh, you're like, gosh, I wish I would have known this in the beginning, even if it's something simple. <laughs> I think the uh, the biggest thing that I've learned is... Not to underestimate the value of grit and realizing that anything worthwhile is going to take a very long time. I, I really, I, I'm uh, kind of a person that's all over the place, right? I've got ADHD. I, I go from one project to the another or to another and um, I get really excited about things. And sometimes it's really hard to see things grow slowly over time. Mm -hmm. And recognizing and being aware that anything that's really valuable takes a long time to build. Sure. It takes a, a, a very strong foundation to build off of, to make it worthwhile. And just to be cognizant of that and not to think of, oh, if this doesn't happen within the first three months, it's a failure. You know, we were told that we were going to need, 
oh gosh, uh, a quarter million dollars to get the festival off the ground. We, Wait, someone we told met, you. Someone that. told us that very at the very beginning, some an early conversation, and I thought to myself, well. That's not going to happen. Uh, I'm a, in my <laughs> last a year of college. Dollars. And if uh, someone trusted me with that kind of money, I would think they're crazy. But being aware that it's going to grow slowly. And if you keep putting in that consistent effort, if it's valuable to the community, keep going, keep pushing. Eventually, you know, those, those people who weren't necessarily wanting to work with you, they're going to see the value. Sure. They're going to mm-hmm. see that it's something that's worthwhile pursuing. I'm sure that you guys have experienced this through this podcast. Oh yeah. Is, it sounds sh- very familiar. Yeah. The the growth is slow at first uh-huh. and you put in all this effort. It doesn't necessarily feel like you're getting anywhere. I still don't feel like I'm, I'm, t- yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Sometimes. It's- but like, how do you, um, what do you do when you feel like, I mean, have you had those moments where you're like, I'm, I just can't. Yeah. It's nothing's yeah. panning out. This is so much work and nobody cares. Yeah. Like what keeps you going? Oh, I have those moments multiple times every year. So, yeah. but I, I think what it really comes back to is when you do have those breakthroughs, when you have those moments where everything's going right mm-hmm. to kind of put almost a, a post-it on that memory. And when you, when you're feeling down, when you feel like nothing's working out, like nothing's pushing forward the way that you want. To go back to that and realize, you know, we've actually checked off quite a few boxes. Imagine where we were three years ago, sure. where we were four years ago. This doesn't seem that bad, mm-hmm. right? We, we've come a long way. Like if you could see where you are now back then, yeah, you you'd would be, be blown super away. excited. Exactly. Yeah. But it's hard to, sometimes you lose sight of that. And mm-hmm. I think those are the moments where you lose motivation when you, and just figuring out a way to kind of regain that. Is yeah. important. How do you know when you want to level up? You know, when you're working on something and it's it's good, and you don't want to c- get complacent. Yeah. I mean, when when to you are are you like okay, it's time to step out of my comfort zone? Oh, so that's me all the time. Oh, okay. Um, I I, ref- I always am looking for the next opportunity mm-hmm. to continue expanding the festival. As soon as we accomplish one thing, it's on to the next. I have a huge list of different. Th- areas and, uh, things that I want to accomplish with it. And I think part of that comes from having a big vision of where it should go. Right. Instead of starting with this idea of, I want to create a film festival, understanding that, you know, you want it to be a world-class film festival. You want to have 30,000 attendees and having that in the back of your mind keeps you steered toward that. Maybe as big as Sundance even, right? You know, that would be, that would be fantastic. But Sundance is, you know, Sundance one of the, it's, is, it is the behemoth, right? You know, the great thing is it's not direct competition, really, though, no. because they're completely different styles. Exactly. And Sundance, um, you know, it's it's interesting because they do some amazing things. And every year I make a point of going up there, mm-hmm. uh, whether for whether for a type of screening or event that's that's going on just so that I can learn from them. Right. Yeah. They, they do. They do an incredible job at putting on a massive event. And while we may not have that kind of complexity yet, understanding the things that they're doing right only helps us expand and do a better job of serving the audience that attends our festival. It's like a competitor analysis. This guy's, this guy's <laughs> smart. Man. I know. I love I mean, it. It's I have fantastic. a question. So on the yeah. we, on the website, it was talking about the Winter Whiteout Festival. Yeah, but there so was, it really wasn't a whole lot of information about. Yeah, that, and that's so. because we're still uh, figuring a little bit of that out. <laughs> but uh, that, it's a new event that we're actually starting up. Is it all about avalanches? <laughs> Just all avalanches. That's what no, I want to see. No, no, but oh. it, it's all about um, winter recreation and celebrating that. So we had started an event a couple of years ago called uh, Here Comes Winter, and it was really just ski film premieres. And we realized we wanted to rebrand it and uh, turn it into something a little bit more interesting. So right now, every year, the ski film premieres uh, come out in Salt Lake, and they, they're, they're starting to show here in the, next, uh, in the next week or two, and they'll be running for a couple months. But what no one's doing is they don't have a winter sport specific uh, festival. And so I mean everything, uh, including snowshoeing, uh, ice climbing, and everything other than just skiing and snowboarding, because I think there's already a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But adding more diversity into what we're showing 
is going to, is going to be something that just sets it a little bit apart. Sure. Uh, we've gotten really good over the last couple of years at doing film screenings, but I don't necessarily feel that winter whiteout is just going to always be only film screenings. I would like to add in gear demos and other, other cool events that we can add on top of it. So it's more of a winter sport festival than a film festival. That is cool. And then the, the same thing, the Fault Line Film Awards. That was another thing I saw yeah, on the website so, when I was kind of lurking and trying to get to know you. And Fault Line is, uh, is really cool. So that was started by some students at the University of Utah at Wasatch Magazine a couple of years ago. And we saw that come out and we thought to ourselves, okay, a festival that is specifically focused on Utah filmmakers in the outdoor recreation environmental space. That's really cool, right? Uh, the Wasatch Mountain Film Festival is an international mountain film festival. So films come in from, uh, I think this year we had films from 58 countries submitted. Wow. That's and awesome. I didn't realize that. Yeah, they come in from all over the world. And what's hard is we get a lot of great Utah filmmakers, but I want to create a, a space that's really for them. Right. And that's where fault line came in. So we had approached the, um, Wasatch magazine about partnering. So now we're actually a 50, 50 partner with them on fault line film awards. So that happens at the university of Utah every year. And what, what's cool is one film from that festival is guaranteed acceptance into Wasatch. Very cool, man. This might be kind of a vague question. So take it how you want, but what do you feel makes a good film festival? I think what makes a good film festival is that there isn't one factor. There's um, a huge part of it is the audience, right? And figuring out what the audience wants and also finding ways to push the boundaries on not on, on showing them and exposing the audience to things that they haven't been exposed to previously. What we found is that stories are, in my opinion, also stories are the most powerful thing on this planet, sure. right? If you mm -hmm. think back to the early days of cavemen sitting around the campfire and figure and just, and just telling stories to each other. And that's what we connect with, I think at a very basic level and finding, finding these stories that people are going to connect with so that when they walk out of that film, they think to themselves, wow, that was amazing. And maybe in some, some aspect of their life, they view, they view some experience differently and, and are able to deal with it in maybe a slightly better way for having experienced that story that someone else has shared with them. How do you, um, do you kind of get uh, feedback from listeners or listeners? I'm sorry. I'm used to our listeners, <laughs> but from viewers, I mean, how do you gauge your audience, what they want to see or, you know, which way to move the dial? Yeah. And there's, there's a, several ways that we do that. So we do send out surveys after the festival, mm -hmm. um, but we also have an audience choice award. It's always very interesting to see how people vote. Uh, we've shifted around multiple times the way that we do that, but seeing what films are gaining popularity, what films people are interested in, what films they really connect with. Uh, and I found that it's all over the place. So one way that I like to look at it is by looking at some of the data, right? So if we send out a survey to people, I like to cor uh, really look and correlate. Well, you know, the people who like this type of film are living in this area, or the people that like this type of film are living in that area. So if we can find films that appeal to different audiences and do that, be very strategic about that, yeah. then I think it's going to benefit them and they're going to enjoy the event a lot more. How many people come out to this? So this year, this year we had uh, 3,500 attendees. That's not bad. Yeah. yeah. So it keeps growing every year. Yeah. I mean, we started I mean, with, uh, at all. Yeah. yeah, we started with uh, what, maybe 60 people sure. our first sure. year. Uh, we had a partnership with uh, the Adventure Gear Fest, and we did a screening in the Southtown Sandy Expo Center and turned that into a theater for the night. And yeah, maybe 60 people. And what's what was cool is our uh, our now festival director, uh, Kelly Closer, she was actually at that screening. Uh, she was one of those 60 people. And I guess and she thought to herself, she had a background in film and Shane and I had no, no concept of what we were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and she said, all right, these guys need some help. I'm going to step in and <laughs> <laughs> help she them took out. Pity yeah. On you. yeah. Well, she now oversees all of our, uh, our venue relations and uh, most importantly, our whole film selection process. So she's cleaned that up and uh, made it a lot better. You, you have like a team, right? You have quite, yeah. quite a team. I mean, mm -hmm. do you care to mention who they are or I guess? Yeah. Them, so I already mentioned Shane um, and he's your, and he's the co-founder. Co co yeah. So Shane and I both started it. Um, he now is kind of focused on uh, getting volunteers. So we're an entirely volunteer run organization. 
Um, everyone from uh, the single event volunteer to myself as executive director, uh, just do it because we're, we're passionate about it. It's something that we care about. Um, so he find, he goes out and finds new people to get involved. Kelly is our, uh, our festival director, as I said. Um, so she is really overseeing the whole festival submission process. She's doing all of the the relations with uh, with the filmmakers and, com- and maintaining communication, which, as you can imagine, wow. this year we had 70, uh, 70 plus films. So you can imagine that's an insane that many of work. directors, producers, people who are in the films being in contact with them. So she has a whole team that works under her. And then we actually just brought on a, uh, a new marketing director, uh, Scott Collins. And he is going to be, he, he really runs all of our marketing. So everything from our social media to our email blasts, paid ads, everything that we do from a promotion standpoint. And we were really fortunate on our board to get, um, to get Scott Richardson and he handles all of our design work. So he owns uh, Incline Design Group. We we're really fortunate to have him. That was one of the things that a real turning point for us as an organization is I used to do all the design work. I have no background in design. I have no idea what I'm doing with that. But he came in and saw us at the, we had a booth at the farmer's market um, and was like, all right, I I think I can help these guys out with uh, creating a new logo. And once our branding was updated, it's amazing how much more receptive people were to working with us. And that's really a big, a big corner that we've turned. Which the the downtown farmer's market. Yeah. Yeah. We we, were usually there. Uh, for about four times every summer. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I love that. Do you post when you're going to be there if people want to come visit you? Yeah, yeah we post when we're going to be there. Uh, and we always have, uh, we've got these cool festival um, uh, burlap bags that people can buy so that they don't have to worry about uh, about you know getting plastic bags. Very and be cool. Be a little more eco-friendly. Yeah, we, awesome. we've, uh, we've been down there. We have set up like an I Am Salt Lake booth, a handful yeah. of uh, Saturdays. Uh, do you have any more Saturdays? Are you going to be there any more this year? You know, we there? just had our last one, actually. Okay. Um, I believe I could be mistaken. Don't quote me on no, that. No, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, we, we've had several throughout the summer already. We may have one more because we're in the process of promoting um, the winter whiteout screening that's coming up, and that'll be on November 7th. So we, we're going to be doing a few tabling events for that. Sure. No, it seemed like it'd be a great way to get the word out about it the is. festival and it get is. it uh, on people's radars. Let's find out a little bit about you, Stuart. I love to find out about people, you know, bring them on the podcast, find out what they do, find out what they do outside of what they do. What are some of your other hobbies and interests when you're not busy doing the film festival. Yeah. So my biggest hobby is really landscape photography. Really? Yeah. Wow. So I've been in, I've did, been I didn't in, see that coming. Did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Me neither. I did not stalk him online. <laughs> I had no idea. No, you do really beautiful photography. Thank you. It's, it's killer. People should go check out your site. What's the site? So it's just Stuart Okay. Yeah. And that's something that it, it's a hobby that I've, uh, I've worked on for many, many years. I mean, my dad uh, was, as I said before about the national park trips, he was really into photography my whole childhood and still is. And that's really what got me into it. But since then, I've been just, ever since I moved out here, I've been shooting pictures and trying to try to build up a portfolio. And it's just, a, it's just one of my favorite things to do. I mean, I was just on a trip uh, to Yellowstone and Grand Teton and uh, waking up at 4:40 in the morning to make to go drive an hour to see one of the most beautiful spots at sunrise. There's this place called Oxbow Bend. I got out there probably before anyone else in the park, and it was completely dark. And there's elk bugling everywhere, and you can hear oh, them wow. off in the distance. And then all of a sudden, the sun starts to come up, and you see uh, Mount Moran and its reflection in the water in the Snake River. And it's those moments. The the photos for me. I don't know. I I enjoy the craft of trying to make amazing shots, but for me, it's almost more about preserving the memory of being there at that, at that place. Uh, that moment never comes again, right? A photograph really captures a single moment in time that can't be replicated. Do you sell these prints at all? I don't right now, but that's something that I'm actually in the process of pursuing. 
Who was Rob? I forgot his last name. The guy that we had on the podcast, oh, man, Rob, Rob. He's a wildlife Do- photographer, Rob. but he's he was. I don't know if you heard that. Do- yeah, no, I actually. Rob Do- Doherty? Do- Do- Doherty. Doherty. Yeah. Doherty. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. I butcher. I'm sorry, Rob. <laughs> You're the best. He's got, I mean, cause he goes up to oh, like yeah. yellow. Do, do, do I've, actually been, awesome I've actually stuff. followed on, on social media, Rob for a long time. Okay. Yeah. I love his shots. He, uh, he really has some spectacular work out there. Isn't uh, it crazy how close he gets to wildlife? Oh, it is. And it's, it's so amazing. tough. I mean, I am just starting to get into wild, wildlife photography, Yeah. but as he kind of talked about in that episode where he was on the show, it's tough. You need some serious equipment, the lenses that you need just to be able, so they're not this tiny little dot. You yeah. can't, you can't get too close to the grizzly <laughs> no. bear. I mean, you can try. What was the story? He talked about a moose. Ch- have you ever had any animals chasing you? Man? Um, I haven't had an animal chase me, but I've had a couple, uh, encounters that were a little closer than I'd like. Let's get, I mean, anything, is yeah. it anything of yeah. a story? So, um, so there's two that really come to mind. So one of them, uh, for a summer when I was in college, I decided, to work as a raft guide up in Alaska uh, in Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Okay, that's cool. Fun. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a, it was a ton cool. of fun. Um, <laughs> but I had a, an encounter where, so McCarthy is the town that I was based out of, and it's right on the edge of the Wrangell Range. It's really in the middle of nowhere. But about a mile and a half from town, you can hike out and get onto a glacier and go hiking out on the glacier. So being there throughout the summer, I did this a couple times, but one time I decided in the late afternoon, I was going to go out there by myself and, uh, I got maybe, maybe about a mile from town and I'm walking down this trail and there's kind of high brush and I hear this sound and it's this grizzly bear waking up. I guess brown bear is probably the appropriate term. And he kind of stands up on his hind legs and, uh, and looks out and kind of makes some sounds and looks over at me and makes a, not not an aggressive growl, um, but it still woke. But it's up. still You're yeah, like, like oh. yeah, it's still a little intimidating seeing you know a seven eight hundred pound uh, bear standing up and you're only. 30 feet from and it. You, oh have, my you have no idea what it's going to do. No, You're just like, no. is this thing going to start charging me? Exactly. I had no idea. So really I, I got as big as I could, uh, made some <laughs> sound and, it, you know, it, it went back to sleep and I turned the other way and didn't feel the need to continue the hike. Well, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Go home and catch your breath for a little exactly. bit after that. Holy cow. <laughs> And then the other one is when I was in school, I had the opportunity to go on a, and I know this is going to sound really tough, but a study abroad to Fiji. And Ooh, was that gorgeous? Oh, it was amazing. We went scuba diving almost every day. We did reef surveys and well, wow. isn't your life difficult? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I, I, I got this really cool experience. And one of the, um, the, the different dives that we did and it was in this place called Benga Bay. And Benga Bay is really famous uh, because it's one of the fewer, maybe the only place in the world where they do uh, dives with uh, shark feedings. So we were down there. I think it was about 80 feet down. And you're not in a cage, right? No, it's no, you're not in a floating. cage. There's um, they go down. The, the dive masters go down there first with a huge, huge garbage can, pretty much full of chopped up fish. And these sharks come in from miles around and there's this swimming torrent of fish. And then the sharks will kind of just swim in and uh, grab a piece from the dive master. Wow. Wow. So being down there, it was really the, one of the first times I ever even went diving period. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a great way yeah, to start. Let me tell to, you, it, it's a really interesting way to start diving. But being out there, I had this, uh, this huge, I, th- I want to say it was a bull shark. That was, uh, you couldn't really see it at first. It was uh, a little too far away. And then it got closer and it got closer and closer and closer. And right at the last moment, I'm really freaking out at this point. Uh, Were you just watching it? Well, yeah, you're just watching it. And you're just like, you're just picturing the Jaws music in your mind. And, but at the same time, you're at 80 feet and there's this realization that, well, if it's going to go after me, it's going to go after me. And there's nothing I can really do about it. The best thing to do is just to remain calm. So I, I didn't do anything. I didn't move. Probably was breathing a little heavier than I should have. But at the last minute, the shark just turned and swam in the other direction. But those are probably the I mean, two you, that come to your mind. Your life was flashing before your eyes, I'm sure, right? I mean, <laughs> do you have it's like PTSD? Scary. Did you watch the movie Meg? Is that I, what it's called? I haven't Meg. seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. It's Meg, like a yeah. gigantic shark movie. I've heard it's really bad, but really good. I don't know. <laughs> I love those, but, though. But They're I mean, great. is that traumatizing to you in any way? I can imagine I would never want to watch a shark movie again. You know, I don't think it really was. Really? Um, 
I think it was more one of the, so the, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of type one, two and three fun, but I would say it was type three fun, which is type one. I'll, I'll explain type one is, you know, it's fun while you're doing it. Yeah. Type two is it's, it's fun when you look back at it. And then type three is it's fun. Cause you didn't, you didn't get killed because you didn't die. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, so I'd say it was probably somewhere between type two and type three. Okay. Yeah. Intra- I've never heard of that before. Yeah. I well, like type one type of fun. I think I'm a type one girl. <laughs> type well, two I think three most sound people awful. are until they've experienced something that uh, really pushes them and then they they almost get addicted to it. It's uh, kind of like the adrenaline junkies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just like, all right, well, what's the next thing? Are you yeah. an adrenaline junkie? Um, I have been. Yeah. I was going to say, I think he yeah. is. I mean, it kind of sounds like it. Based film festival, he's, he's got going. Dude, yeah, that I mean, would, I've done yeah. a lot of cool trips. Um, I guess I had an experience where... I, my my adrenaline seeking kind of slowed down. Mm-hmm. Um, I so I used to do a lot of mountaineering, uh, and I started. I kind of kicked it off with a Knowles trip, and uh, got to go hike Kilimanjaro with my dad. And from there, I was like, okay, I've done some cool things. I can really go out and do you know some of these bigger adventures on my own. And I had a situation. I don't know if you've heard of Mount Washington in New Hampshire at all, but it's the highest mountain on the East Coast. And it's, it's only about 60, so it's like a hill. 800 feet. Yeah. So it's, it's really <laughs> not that tall, uh, but it's known for having some of the worst weather in the world. Really? Yeah. So the temperatures there can be, oh, negative 30, negative 40. In and, New Hampshire? In New Hampshire. And huh. what's crazy is there's multiple weather systems that converge on the summit. So it's one of the windy, it actually used to hold the record for the highest wind speed on earth. And they don't really know what the wind speed was. Cause I, I believe the the device measuring it actually broke at about 240 miles an hour or something Holy around crap. there. Uh, but when I was up there, I decided I was going to climb it in the winter. Uh, Cause why not? Cause why not? Exactly. Why not? You know, <laughs> it's not like it's going to be cold or yeah. anything. <laughs> so it was something around negative 20, negative 25. And there were sustained winds at oh my gosh. over well over a hundred miles an hour. And that was a situation where I was like, okay, you know, if I keep doing this, I'm going to wind up doing something that's just really stupid and I'm going to get myself into some serious trouble. And that's kind of where, like missing fingers. Yeah, yeah, and, I'm, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I had to, I actually had some uh, frost nip after that, after that trip. Really? Yeah, my whole side of my hand was about purple for two months. Oh my god! I mean, were you a Boy Scout? I wasn't actually. Yeah, it, I wasn't. It's speaking of frostbite and yeah. bite, and I mean, I I, I loved Boy Scouts <laughs> yeah. growing up. I never got my Eagle Scout, but I <laughs> I love the Boy Scouts. Let's talk Salt Lake City, though. Let's yeah. talk Salt Lake City. Um, you probably heard me talk about this on the podcast, Stuart. If somebody was visiting Salt Lake City this weekend, obviously the film festival is not going on. Otherwise, we'd tell them to go check that out. What would you tell people to go do or check out? You know, I, I would say go explore the mountains. We have so many amazing trails, so many amazing places to go explore. Really for a range of people, whether you can't go very far or you have the strength and stamina to do a big trail, there's plenty to experience especially if you're not from the mountains, there's no reason why you shouldn't go and experience them. I mean, there's some amazing hikes to be done and that's what I'd recommend people spend their time doing. Now, what if, what if say somebody's listening, they've never been here. They don't know where the trails are. How do you even find out where all the trails are? Get a book. I guess, there's, huh? I mean, there's all sorts of resources, everything from visit Salt Lake to there's numerous apps out there to, to, to use and follow. Do you know an app off the top of your head? Um, all trails is one that I personally use. They have a great, uh, great resource. We're actually in the process with Wasatch mountain arts of building out an entire resource for people who are planning on visiting, uh, visiting the Wasatch, uh, and, kind of building it from the perspective of if you're coming here for adventure, uh, this is what you can do in the back country. This is what you can do in the front country. That is such a great idea. Yeah. I like that. I'll idea. be excited when that comes out. I want to, I want to send that out to people. Yeah. Let me know when it comes out. Yeah, I will. We get a lot of people listening to the podcast, you know, that are visiting or just moving here. So it's like, Hey, you know what, if you want to go do hiking, I, I know we had Mark Benson on from mm-hmm. Waymark, uh, yeah, Waymark Gear company, Gear Co. friend of mine that makes hiking backpacks. Nice. Uh, I think he was talking about how to find some trails and stuff like that, you know, I think it's more of a community Um, thing. Like, well, and I know you can just drive up the hill, right. And probably find like, and that's another great way to do it. You know, there's nothing wrong with just going out and exploring. I mean, when I first moved here, that's what I did. I, I happened, I didn't even read up on any trails or really anything about the mountains. I wound up, I think it was my first weekend here. I wound up dr- mis- mistakenly driving up Big Cottonwood Canyon Road and hey, finding everything yeah. up there yeah. and just being blown away. 
Beautiful up that way. What about favorite local eating spots, Stuart? I would imagine you got a place you like or, or one depends, or two. Depends on the, depends on the cuisine. There's yeah. so, we have a lot of good restaurants. I've actually, that's one of the things in the time that I've lived here. I've noticed is there's so many great restaurants that are popping up and so many great ones that have been around for a long time. What about, let's say a, a, a Sunday brunch. One of my favorites is actually up at the Alta Lodge, up Little Cottonwood. Um, that place is pretty pretty special. The not only do they have great food, but you look out over the, the what's, amazing what's vista. The, whole the Alta Lodge. Oh, Alta Lodge. Yeah. Just, that's the name of it. Alta yeah. Lodge. It's the Alta at, Lodge. It's at is the great. Alta Lodge. Yeah, they have a great one, and I, I like going to um, the Dodos. Another favorite yeah. of mine. That's a good one. What about like a a nice quick sit down place? So just like, if you want to have a quick sit down in Salt Lake city, um, you know, I there's really, a McDonald's right there. There's, <laughs> there's like one, yeah. you know, a relatively quick sit down. I really like going to, um, I, you know, a nice, a nice evening dinner at, at squatters yeah. or, or, mm-hmm. or any of the breweries really yeah. is, is fun. Dude, the burgers, it's easy. On. They have great food. And so good, yeah, good beer. I mean, if, oh, you, yeah, you know, if, you're, if you're a beer, another thing we have here is great beer. Isn't that crazy, man? Yeah. Great beer, great distilleries, mm-hmm. great people, great film festivals. What would you change about Salt Lake city? If you could, ch- or the area in general, the biggest thing that I would change and has been one of my biggest struggles with living here is the air quality. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really tough because there's, uh, there's a lot of factors. It's, there's no easy solution to it. Uh, there's a lot of things that I, I know that we could do to help clean it up, but that's the biggest thing that I would, uh, that change. I, I would change. And I'm actually just starting the process and, uh, talking to some potential people about, uh, creating a documentary about it. I've been on, you know, as I said, I don't come from a film background, but, I'm actually trying to get into that side of things and really so that I can also better understand what goes into making these films so that when we're putting on the film festival, I really know the process better. This is a pro- a personal project that I'm just starting on is uh, I, talking I, about the air quality. A, a, a documentary. Now I could probably put you in, in touch with a, a friend. Yeah. Uh, well, he's been on the podcast, Carl Ingwell. Do you yeah. know Carl? Yeah. 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 He's a, he's a longtime friend of mine. Uh, he's been on, on the podcast. He's does a lot with the air air quality would love to probably help you out. I know he was actually working on some different projects with that as well. Let's run down the list though, Stuart, how can people get a hold of you? How can people find out about the film festival? Let's, let's talk about this. Yeah. The best way uh, to find out information on the film festival is a, to follow us on any of our social channels. Uh, we're pretty easy to find. We're very active. Uh, just search Wasatch mountain film festival. and We'll always come up. But visiting us on our site at wasatchfilmfestival.org is really, and signing up for our newsletter is really the best way to find out about events coming up and, and really what's going on. Also, if you want to get involved, as I, as I said, we're an all volunteer run organization. So we, you know, in whatever capacity your people are interested in getting involved, we're always looking for help in a wide range of areas. Cool. And people can submit films. Absolutely. So all of our films are, uh, can films can always be submitted through film freeway. That's the platform that we use, but there's a link to it on our site. It's uh, probably easier nowadays because you can just upload it versus it's all, oh, it's yeah. all digital. sending an old VHS tape in, right? That's how <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Yeah, no, all of it's digital. This and... wall of VHS tapes. Right? Oh, and but but once the fe- once the films are accepted, then we have a wall of hard drives. That yeah, you just swap one piece out for another, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> and they're easy. Well, they're not easier to lose if they're hard drives, huh? Oh. Anything can catch on fire, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope it doesn't. I hope no, it doesn't. No. Anything before we wrap up here, Chrissy, is there anything else you want to ask him? Yeah. I mean, I love your take on pretty much everything. So what's a piece of advice that you would leave with our listeners? Just like life advice. The biggest life advice I would give is don't be afraid if you see if you see something that you want to do, but you think that it's going to be really hard to make it happen. Don't be afraid to take the first step. I think so many people are so afraid of something failing that they don't try in the first place. And if you can take that first step and then take maybe that second or third step, you're far more likely to have a more rewarding life if you pursue what you're passionate about. Perfect. Perfect place to end the podcast. You've been a heck of a guest. Thank you so much, Stuart, for doing the podcast with us. I am excited to come and check out the Wasatch Film Festival. Uh, Hopefully our listeners do as well. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this well, thank like you so much. It's been a pleasure to be on the show, yeah. and you know, I'd love to love to have you guys come out and and attend one of the screenings for yourself. Thank you so much. All right. Many thanks again to Stuart Derman for joining us on this episode of the podcast and sharing his story. You can head on over to our website at IamSaltLake.com slash 348 for all the links you need to get in touch with him and find out everything you need to know about the Wasatch Film Festival. And while you're on the website, why don't you go ahead and dig through some of those back episodes? I'm sure there are a few that you've probably missed listening along the way. You know, I know there's a lot that people have missed. It's interesting when I reshare old episodes, like yeah. on social media, people be like, how did I miss that one? Yeah. Or they'll suggest people and we're like, hey, <laughs> go had, check out number. We've had those. So share them on Facebook and Twitter and, and even Pinterest. I don't know. But yeah. Hey, can we talk about a little tiny business venture that I'm currently working on? Podcast editing. That's right. I've been editing some podcasts for a few clients. I've actually thoroughly enjoyed. A lot of people don't realize I edit this podcast, which people say it sounds good. So I'm assuming it's I'm doing a good job on it. But a lot of people are starting up podcasts and they're like, I don't have time to edit. That's when you can come to me. We can chit chat. I could tell you what it would cost you and save you some free time. I mean, it's it's a great way to free up some time. Let's see if we're a good fit. And if we're not a good fit, I actually know a bunch of other podcast editors as well that might be a good fit for you. So shoot me an email. Chris at IamSaltLake.com is the best way to get a hold of me. And that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you so much to our amazing sponsors, Ammon Clef Creative, Five Wives Vodka, and The Melting Pot. You can visit our website at IamSaltLake.com. You can send us an email at hello at IamSaltLake.com. Can I actually, I want to mention this. We got a P.O. box, guys. We got a P.O. box. I'm kind of jumping in here. I have the key on my keychain. So we decided, let's set up a P.O. box. Uh, That way, you know, people can send us CDs, like if there's any local bands listening, Salt Lake City bands. I mean, I'll I'll listen to bands from other states too. But whatever you want to send us, gifts, treats, cookies, uh, you know, maybe a little birthday card or something. (laughs) You know. (laughs) Whatever. Our our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 4412, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84110. Fill that P.O. Box up. And if you send us a gift, we'll probably talk about it on the podcast. Right, Chrissy? For sure we will. Absolutely. We'll give you a big old shout out. All right. You guys have a great week. Make sure to get out and enjoy the city. Support local. And we'll see you on the next episode. And good night, Grammy. (laughs) 